everyone pass these around. Please, everybody, fill one of these out, whether you're a member or if you're here for your first time. Uh, what these are, after, after we finish up today, uh, after Jeff and Francie finish up, uh, I don't know if you saw our itinerary that was on Facebook, immediately following, Reed is going to do the workout grace. Um, and what grace is, is 135 pound clean and jerks, 30 reps for time. Um, don't, that's not the workout you guys are going to be doing here today. But um, <laughs> the reason we're doing that workout is, I don't know if, uh, if you heard, there was a, a weightlifting accident in California where a CrossFit coach from Colorado was in a weightlifting competition. His name was Kevin Ogar, and um, in what looked like a rather um, benign miss, he, he missed, the, missed the lift that he was doing, didn't look like anything uh, uh, spectacular by any means after I saw the video. He actually paralyzed himself from the waist down, and uh, his medical bills are stacking up. So the reason Reed is doing brace is this particular lifter and crossfitter was really involved in the charity Barbell for Boobs, which is 30, or 30 clean and jerks for time, and you raise money for breast cancer research, and he's really involved in that. And um, so what we're doing is, as a gym, we're going to be taking donations and pledges for Reed to do this. Kind of like a walkathon, except the only difference is what we're, getting, what we're asking for in terms of pledges is to pledge um, a dollar amount per second that Reed finishes the workout under two minutes. So Reed won't tell you this, but Reed has one of the best grace times probably in the country. He's probably in the top ten in the whole country. Um, he has a really fast grace time, so his goal today, I'm going to hold him accountable to this, is to do the workout in a minute 15, which would be right up there with some of the best athletes, with some of the best CrossFit athletes in the country. No pressure. Yeah. So, okay. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's a lot of people are getting fast at that workout, and he's, he's one of them. Um, so that's, that's what that sheet going around is. It also gives us a little bit of information about yourself as well, too. Um, we do ask you, you know, you don't have to make a big pledge or a big donation, but we will be making this to a, a fundraiser that was set up for Kevin Ogar as well, too. And then afterwards, for those of you interested, uh, we're all going to work out as a group. We're going to do a five-minute version of Cindy. Or, I'm sorry, a ten-minute version of Cindy. Uh, as a group, we're going to have some fun and, and do a quick, easy workout. going to scale it to all levels and all abilities, so I, I encourage everybody to stick around after that. Um, but I'm going to bring up the two reasons that you guys are, are here, the other reason you braved the snow. Um, they, uh, they contacted me, it's kind of a funny story, Jeff contacted me and left me a voicemail over the summer and I didn't really, I could understand a little bit but I wasn't exactly sure who it was, I, I heard Jeff from Biggest Loser and stuff like that and, and when I called him back I assumed I was talking to like his agent or something, I don't know, I'm like, so when does Jeff want to come in and check the place out, he's like, no this is Jeff, I was like, all right, I'm embarrassed. But, uh, they, they've been coming to the gym ever since, and uh, they've been very inspiring. Uh, I know a lot of our members love having them around, and uh, we're very grateful to them for doing this for us, and uh, very grateful to, to have them here to share their story with you. And uh, I want to bring them up. Come on up, Jeff and Frank. Thank you, guys, very very much. Um, Thank you to Matt, Reed, everyone here at CrossFit Burkina for having us, teaching us, and showing us the way. Because while we did do some CrossFit on the show, you know, it was very limited. And coaches like Maggie over here uh, basically help us with all of our form and keeping true to, to what we learned. So we're going to go over a little bit of what got us to trap for the show, uh, a little bit of our stories, life before, biggest loser, and all that, and kind of what has uh, happened since. So. Um, I switched this up the last time we did one of these talks. I let Francine go first, so I'm going to do that again. And Francine's going to share her story with you first, and then I have to try to outside her because she usually does such a better job. So we do speaking for work, and um, he always goes first. And at this last thing, I was like, oh, Francine can go first. So I had like all my thoughts, you know, thinking I'm going to go second, and now I'm going to go yeah. Um, I'm Francie and I was on season 14 of The Biggest Loser. Um, my story is a little bit different from most Biggest Losers. If you guys watch this show, usually it's somebody who has never worked out, never lost a significant amount of weight or anything like that. But when I was a little bit different, so I want to talk about that. Um, I was over 350 pounds and um, yeah, that was the craziest crazy would be to say that now. but. Um, I'm obviously short, <laughs> and uh, I was basically, I just had graduated from college, and uh, I was a straight-A student, a published researcher, a full-blown nerd, double major, <coughs> biology, psychology, all into neuroscience, uh, 4.0. Um, I was essentially the girl on paper. 
Um, and I was getting ready um, to apply to medical school, and I knew that I was perfect on paper and on my resume. I mean, it spoke volumes of my hard work and dedication, but there was an interview part to it. And I found myself literally in my room one day saying, oh my god, I just spent four years of my life, you know, making myself just perfect <coughs> on paper, but now I'm too embarrassed to show up to this interview and say that I want to be a doctor when I was 350 pounds. And um, I, I felt that like I was a hypocrite, sort of, when I would, you know, tell somebody that I wanted to be a doctor, and they would be like, oh, that's awesome. Well, we know you're a smart girl, but there's always like that afterthought, like, well, if you want to be a doctor who preaches health, then why would you be 350 pounds? It sort of was speaking to how I was not balanced in life. I was very good in school, but I had sort of neglected every other aspect of my life. And um, basically, that's the moment where I said, you know, I gotta do something about it. And I decided not to apply to medical school that year, which was a major blow to my ego. I mean, I probably had hit rock bottom there because I had spent four years of my life on a plan. And I was like, well, I can't do this now. And you sort of did this to yourself, so now you have to fix it. So it was hard dealing with that part, but <coughs> it was pretty successful. Um, in the beginning, I essentially did Weight Watchers and I did Zumba. <laughs> And I lost close to 100 pounds on my own before I even got on the show. So then I hit the infamous plateau, and I couldn't lose any more weight, and I was still much bigger. And I was like, I still can't, I still don't feel comfortable, you know, showing up to this interview, um, especially since I was going to apply to the MD PhD combined program. It's fully sponsored. Um, it's basically the cream of the crop. Like it's the highest. Uh, it's the highest, um, oh, I guess you can get for being like a researcher, which was my interest, and I wanted to be able to do research and then practice my medicine. So that's what I wanted to do. So I needed to be able to sell myself, not only on paper, but in person in this interview, because I was going to be competing against people not only in the U.S., but outside of the U.S., who literally do this for, like, study for hours. So they were just as competent as me. Um, so when I lost, you know, the first 100 pounds, I thought that I was getting better, you know, at being able to sell myself, but not good enough yet. And so I saw a commercial for The Biggest Loser and how there was a casting call. I had never watched the show in my life, but I did see on that commercial that people went from being much bigger to much smaller. And I'm like, well, might as well try it out. And I went to a casting call in Philly. I'm from New York. And um, I was kind of nervous. I'm like... Oh God, I, I mean, there's going to be so many people there, how would they pick me, you know? And I was like, whatever, you know, if it's supposed to happen, it will happen. And uh, I literally, uh, you know, to this day I say, it was my hair that got me into it because <laughs> I uh, showed up with like my hair loose and, you know, I was kind of like a diva looking big girl, you know, so I still thought I was cute, you know? So I showed up there you know, with my hair like super big, big earrings, you know? and of course my big eyes and stuff and the girl just like looks at me you know and she's like wow you have a lot of hair and i'm just like yeah I'm like i want to be in the show you don't think this hair you know like you know with my big personality and stuff like that so i had the personality to match my hair i guess and um to this day i said that's you know that's why i got on the show because literally they ask you a question and you get to answer 30 seconds in my opinion that wasn't enough to so initially in my opinion it's because i made her look you know, and um, then I got on the show, and obviously you lose some more weight there, and I'm literally half the size that I used to be, so that's awesome, but I'll tell you what I gathered from the show that was important, it was like the missing link um, to why I had hit this infamous plateau. When um, I was trying to lose weight on my own, I sort of was being a scientist about it. I'm like, you eat less, and you exercise a whole lot, and that's just it, that's what you have to do. But I wasn't addressing the real problem. Um, and that's what I got to do on Biggest Loser. Basically, um, you have a lot of time to think. There's no music, and for, I mean, for hours. We were working out five to eight hours, and you, all you had were your thoughts, <laughs> you know? So you had to, like, entertain yourself somehow. And, um, you know, the coaches there, like Dalvet, you know, Jillian Michaels, Bob Harper, they basically try to tell you, you need to think about how you ended up where you were. How did you let yourself go that far and why did you take care of yourself? And now that you've lost, you know, close to 100 pounds, why are you stopping yourself? Why are you self-sabotaging? That kind of stuff. 
And um, while I was there, I started thinking back, like, okay, well, you know, how did I put on this much weight? How was I so neglectful? And I was thinking back to, you know, my childhood. And um, I had a very weird relationship with my father. And um, I never used to talk about it. it. It's not, in my culture, that's kind of taboo. You don't talk about, like, the problems that you have at home. So I sort of never spoke to anybody. But I comforted myself with food. Um, my father, when I was growing up, was an alcoholic. I, he was a very unstable alcoholic. Um, you know, you all have, we're talking about the, you know, uncle who drinks. Um, and some of them are funny, and some of them are really mean. My dad was that, the mean drunk who I was scared to death from, you know, and um, there was many nights that, you know, he would come home drunk and I would, was literally shaking. I couldn't sleep that night. So, I, like, even to this day, I don't really sleep well because I was so used to, like, just staying up throughout the night in, in fear, you know, and it was something that I never got to share with anybody. I never told anybody about it, and I, all I did was eat my emotions, and um, I did well in school with hopes that I could save my mom, that kind of, that mentality. Um, so while I was, you know, on the show, this is the kind of stuff that I was thinking about, like, Okay, so, so that's when you started, you know, um, relating to food in this emotional way and looking, for, um, looking at it for comfort instead of just nutrition and, um, and, and just uh, to sustain life. It, it took this, you know, food had this very important role in my life, which was kind of weird. You know, I was happy I ate, I was sad I ate, I was stressed I ate. And you know, during college that became even worse because right before I went to college, my father actually ended up uh, passing away. So for years, you know, I had this very unstable relationship with my dad. Um, and most of it, I completely disliked him. I hated him. I would say, you know, I wish you would die. Like, you make my life so miserable. I can't believe this. And then he dies. And then I'm left with all this guilt. I'm like, oh my God, I killed him. You know, like, I had wished it upon him so much, and now he's, he's gone. Um, but I constantly refer back to how I had such a weird relationship with him because it's like, the more he did to my family and I, the more I loved him. You know, that, that kind of like sick relationship because when he wasn't drinking, he was, he was awesome. And you know, throughout, you know, growing up, all I thought was like, why can't you just stop drinking? You know, because you, you are an awesome guy when you're not drinking. The problem was, he was always drinking, you know? So out of seven days out of the week, it was only like one day that he wasn't drinking. He was the perfect dad then. Um, so when, you know, when my father passed away, I was left with this incredible amount of guilt because I'm like, oh my god, this is terrible. Like, I had wished, you know, death upon him and, and that kind of stuff. And so while I was in college, I gave even more with him. And uh, that's how I got to where I was. Um, so on the show, I thought about all these things and uh, eventually I came to the conclusion that, you know, eating my emotions and doing that kind of stuff was no way to honor my dad and that I need to, you know, let go, let go of the guilt because just as I was fighting my own demons with him because of my relationship with him, perhaps he was doing that. And maybe I will, I mean, I will never know what he went through, that he was taking it out on the all, uh, you know, on my family, um, but I know that I only have one life and I need to live it in a way that I feel fulfilled and, and not carry his baggage with me. And so here I am today. Um, I'm in a better place now. I'm much more confident about myself. I, you know, the demons don't go away. You always, you know, it, if you do something for years, you always have that in, in, in back of your head, especially with food addiction, because you just have to interact with it. I, I can't compare it to any other addiction in terms of like, say alcohol or like smoking, something like that. You can completely leave it aside. But with our addiction, you still have to interact with food. And you interact <coughs> in such a weird way before that, you know, even if we're much better now, um, you still have days where you, you need to, you know, I need to set myself up for the right circumstance. I'm weird about, like, the people I go out with. You know, I won't put myself in a situation where I am more likely to, to fall. I don't trust myself, essentially. Um, but Jeff and I are here now, and um, we lost a ton of weight uh, on the show, and we still want to lose weight. Um, right now, we're getting ready to get our skin removed. That's another thing people don't speak about. It's um, once you lose, you know, over a certain amount, and your frame can't carry that, you do have a lot of excess skin, especially if you lost the weight cardio-based, which is why we actually love and promote CrossFit, because um, it's slow and it builds muscle. 
which is important not only to keep the weight off, but for the condition of your skin. And so we've been doing a ton of CrossFit for that reason, and um, it's helped with our skin, but since we both have lost over 150 pounds, we still have a lot of extra <coughs> skin. And actually, we just oh. set the date for March 25th, so we will be skinless. <laughs> yeah. um, which is great because um, removing the skin will make it easier for us to do certain things and also to keep losing weight. Um, it's like carrying, you know, like two twins around. So you want to be more functional. I, you know, we work for Big Susan Run Walk, which is a race company, and you know, I run all the time. But I'm, all I'm thinking about, I'm very competitive, is. Okay, once the skin is gone, can I run faster? Or like, once the skin is gone, can I squat deeper? Because, you know, I still have all this skin in the mid area of my legs, that kind of stuff. Um, and sure, we can hide it sometimes, but you really can't hide it. Like, not from yourself, at least. We wear, we wear compression, so it makes it easier for you to be more functional. Um, when you do like, for example, think about you doing like a box jump or a burpee, and then like the skin is going in the opposite direction of where you're going, you know? It, it's terrible to think about, um, but it's an important part to speak about. And we actually linked up with a surgeon <coughs> who um, is very interested in bringing awareness to this area of weight loss. But I'll let Jeff said the rest because I like to speak a lot. Uh, I think she always brings a very good point when she talks about uh, fighting your demons, that the demons don't go away, and I never looked at it, at, you know, it's always like, slay your demons, put your demons behind you, but uh, Joe, who was on our season of Biggest Loser, he was the former pro athlete, he put it to me in a different way, he said, you have to embrace your demons and make friends with your demons, because <clears throat> once you learn from your demons, your demons are the ones that are going to get you to where you need to go, so... I look at it like that, you know, you have to remember where you came from, you have to understand what got you there, and you have to embrace that because no matter what, that is a part of who you are and that has gotten you where you need to go. My story is a little bit different than hers, uh, but a lot of things are very similar. As for the weight loss before the show, I had none of that. Um, you know, I was the person who did the yo-yo dieting. I was the person who would lose 40 pounds and then gain that 40 and find 20 more. So it, it was always an uphill battle for me. <clears throat> and when I was young, I was really small, like really, really tiny, up until I was about six or seven years old. And I was always in and out of the hospital with asthma problems. I had really, really bad asthma. And the doctors were like, okay, you know, we think putting him on this steroid will help with his asthma. It'll bulk him up. It'll help his immune system, which did all those things, but it also helped bulk me up and I never lost that bulk because I was like the child that needed to be wrapped in bubble wrap to do anything. You know, my parents were very like scared that I was going to get sick or I was going to get hurt or I was going to do this because I was always in and out of the hospital so much. So I lived a very sedentary lifestyle until I was probably about 10 years old and then I started to play hockey and I was really good at hockey. I played travel hockey, I played for a league called Little Caesars so you did a lot of traveling around and then we moved. <clears throat> and there was no <clears throat> real hockey team where we moved. So I played for like their startup league one year and it was garbage. I was the best person there. My parents were like, okay, well, probably not going to go to the NHL, so we can't afford to keep carting you back and forth pretty much, you know, two hours a day to go practice and play hockey. So from there, I became even more sedentary. The weight started to pack on. And it wasn't until high school towards the end of my senior year that I hit a very, very rapid weight gain. And that happened because uh, December 23rd of 2004, my dad was diagnosed with lung cancer. So between December 23rd and February 7th of 2005 when he passed away, it was probably the most difficult time of my life. It was, everything was happening so fast. I was the only person that lived at home with my <clears throat> mom and dad. My sister was in law school in Boston. She was flying home every weekend, but still all the stress, the fighting, everything landed on me. And I was 17 at the time. I didn't really know how to take it, didn't really know how to handle it. My dad was from the old school. He was born in 1930. So with him, it was like, you know, rub some dirt in it. You're fine. You know, he, he didn't really have a lot of emotions that he shared. And it wasn't until probably two or three weeks before he passed away that he had pretty much asked everyone to leave his hospital room except me. And he had basically told me that I need to take care of my mom. I need to take care of the house. I need to not argue with her. I need to do whatever I need to do to make sure things are taken care of. And I was like, okay. And at 17 years old, that's a lot to figure out. You don't really understand how you're going to do that. And you try to make decisions 
fast forward what you were asking. Yeah. So I did that and you know, it, it's coming time for me to go away to college and I don't know what I should do. My mom is basically stuck on the couch. She's super depressed and you know, I had to have a conversation with her like, I know you want me to stay home, but if I stay home and go to this community college, it's not going to be what's best for me and in the long run not going to be what's best for anyone. So I need to go away to school and I need to go do what I have to do. I'm not going to go as far as I had originally planned. So I'm going to stay in state. I'm going to be two hours away, but I have to do what I have to do. So she completely understood, completely respected yeah. that, but also yeah. at a time where I was transitioning my life to this whole other thing, I was trying to learn how to become a man in a different sense, but doing that all on my own without any adult male figures. So I had a lot of stuff that I was trying to deal with, so the freshman 15 for me became you know, the freshman 65. And it wasn't until the end of my, towards the end of my freshman year of college that <clears throat> I was like, okay, you know, I, I want to get this weight thing under control. I weighed in at 342 pounds around spring break of my freshman year of college, which was like 2006. And so I went to the doctor, I was like, hey, I'm gonna do this right, I'm gonna you know, do everything I need to do. I ended up getting down to like 302 pounds, and I was like, yeah, this is awesome, this is great. And then for some reason I fell off track and put it all back on. Then it was two years later, and I was like, okay, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do it on my own, I know what I need to do, went to the gym, <laughs> went to the gym uh, and I lost like 70 pounds that time and I was, I was feeling great, I was doing great and then one night being stupid, being drunk, I shattered my ankle. So in the middle of that whole thing I shattered my ankle and from there I was couch ridden. I, that happened literally June 10th, school had just got out a month earlier, I had the whole summer and that was my, my big plan was I'm going to do so great this summer, I'm going to shock everyone and it was the exact opposite. I was laid up on a couch the entire summer and into the fall. So it, it really backfired for me and I gained all the way back uh, in then some. So fast forward a few years, I was really successful in my career. Um, I had done some consulting, I was working for a pharmaceutical company. You know, I, I had saved a lot of money for someone who was 23 years old and I was like, you know what, I, I hate living in Michigan, I hate it here. My friend got an opportunity to uh, take an athletic director position at University of Hawaii and I was like, well, dude, I can just transfer my job and I can go out there with you. I'm coming to Hawaii. And he was like, really? And I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm there. So I packed up everything. And literally in a three-week span, I made this decision. I was going to go to Hawaii. Everything was going to be better because I was in Hawaii. How could it not be better? And I got to Hawaii, and the very first night that I got there, I remember I cried in my bathroom because I instantly knew that I was still miserable and I was going to be miserable until I figured out what it was within me that was not there, was not right, and was not okay. And deep down I knew that part of that was my struggle with my weight. So I was in Hawaii for like six weeks, and I finally told my friend, I'm like, yo, I gotta go. He's like, who does this? Who comes to Hawaii? Like, and then just like six weeks later, they gotta go. Like, he's like, you didn't live here, you took a really long vacation. And I'm like, well, whatever. So I went back home, and then I had some downtime in between uh, jobs and things, so I was like, well, you know, I'm watching uh, something on Hulu, and then I see like an ad, like, watch Big Suzer and finales in one week. So I'm like, all right, I've never watched the show. My sister would always talk about it on holidays, like, you know, we're fat, we need to go on this show. And I'm like, I hate reality TV, so no. And <laughs> <laughs> so I watched season 13 from episode one all the way up until the episode right before the finale. And I had no intention of watching that many episodes. I just wanted to see the, the gimmick, the, the shtick. I thought it was going to be the next Real Housewives or whatever city they're in now. <laughs> and so I watch it and I'm like, all right, like there was a guy in there that instantly I connected with. He had a very similar personality as to what it seemed to me. He was from Michigan, like two hours from where I was from. He weighed literally at the time like 14 pounds more than me. And he was only two years younger than me. And as I watched the season, I was like connecting with him on so many different levels. And I'm like, man, this guy's going really far, he's going really far, and then the second to last episode, he was eliminated. And I'm like, oh, I thought this guy was going to take it all. Then, he, the very next episode, that same night on the show, he, uh, he got an opportunity to win his spot back and become a finalist. And he did just that. He won his spot back against everyone else that was on that season and earned his spot back to become a finalist. And so I literally finished watching this like the night before the live finale. I was up to like two in the morning the night before. I'm like, I gotta finish it, I gotta finish it, I gotta see what happens, I gotta catch it live. And at the live finale, he ended up winning. And I'm like, all right, if this guy can do it, 
I can absolutely do it. I was like, I feel that I have a great story to tell, and given the opportunity, you know, I feel like I can really shine at this. And I went to the casting call, and you know, the rest, the rest is just history, really. So I mean, and I and I told that story a million times about the guy who won the season before me, and I've had the opportunity to meet him and talk to him at this point, and you know, we we've chatted on the phone several times, and you know, he he he's like, you know, I never thought when I went on the show that anyone that ever went on the show after me would ever be like, you know, I saw you and I thought I could do it. And I had that same feeling until this season when we got the opportunity to go back to the ranch and talk to some of the contestants that each one of them had someone different from our season that they identified with. And every one of us that had the opportunity to go back, you know, we heard their stories. And, and it was really a, a very important moment for us because while we went on that show to, to do something selfish, we went on that show to work on ourselves, which everyone is allowed to do. Everyone is allowed to put themselves first. And we never thought that it would have the impact on someone else's life to actually help, help have them make a change. And it did. And to hear that and to see it one-on-one, -on -one, you know, we, we get a lot of people on social media that are like, I'm doing this because of you, I'm doing this because of you. But you can't necessarily track those people and you can't see their, their success. But with these people, you can, and to know that you helped put them in that position, you know, it was really humbling for us and that was something that, you know, we to this day don't even really understand that that we've done for other people. But, you know, it's what we try to tell everyone is that it's the people that do it at home without a television show, that do it, you know, with kids, with work, with school, <coughs> with family, with financial problems, with everything that there is going on in the world, that still choose to make time for themselves and put themselves first and do what they know they need to do to better themselves for the future, whether it be for the future of their kids, the future of themselves, whatever. You know, those people are the people that are the true inspiration for us because we were given a golden ticket, an opportunity that less than 1% of the world gets. And, you know, we're thankful for that every day, but, you know, it's, it's the people that do it on their own that, uh, that are the true inspiration.